Alrighty, welcome back, and once again, I can't tell you just enough how excited I am to be all, all caught up. And the reason for that is because now I can actually stay caught up. And even though I may have just wanted to call it a little early today, I have decided to go over our lecture notes and stick it out for the day. So criminal law today. Done a lot of criminal law today right, in the sense of the amount of course material that I've had to cover. We just finished our justification defenses. And justification defenses, if you recall, means that you're doing something that's good for society, even if it would normally be considered a wrong. And because it's something that's good for society, you are justified in doing what would normally be considered a wrong. And of our justification defenses, we have self-defense, we have defense of others, we have defense of property, defense of habitation, and we have necessity, or in other words, the choice of evil. That was finishing up justification defenses, and now we are moving on to excuse defenses. And just to recall what excuse defenses are, excuse defenses are when you are doing something that is wrong, is morally wrong, and doesn't have a benefit for society, but you are excused or you have a reason for why you did that wrong. And we're talking about two of those excuses today. Our first one is going to be duress, and the second is going to be intoxication as far as excuses that people can have. Once again, I just want to note that excuses, because it's something that is wrong, I am not so much a fan of allowing these as much as we are a fan of allowing justification. So a couple of these aren't going to sit right, especially when we get to insanity and other potential excuses. But let's go ahead and start with duress. We have two parts of duress that I want to talk about. First, provide an overview of what duress work is, how it works, and then share how it may apply to murder if you can have duress as an excuse in a murder charge. So first we have United States versus content to uh, pecan, pecan, something like that. What happened here is that the person was a taxi car driver in Colombia and he, one of his passengers one day offered uh, him to be a personal driver and he said, okay, I'll consider it. And so he came a couple days later and instead of being a taxi driver, well, the person wanted him to smuggle money. Originally he said, okay, I'll consider it. And then he came back and later told him, no, I'm not going to do that. And the person told him some certain details about his life, told him his name, his wife's name, his uh, child's name, told him where he lived, uh, told him how old his family members were and ultimately said, we're watching you. If you don't do this, we're going to uh, pretty much kill your family. And so he ends up not telling the police because he believed that the police were corrupt and hopped on a plane with a person watching him and attempted to smuggle several bags of illegal drugs into the United States. He was caught in a prison, and he said that he did so under duress. Well, what are the requirements for duress? Can he actually make this argument? The trial court said no, but the requirements say that if you have an immediate threat of death or serious bodily injury, that's the first element. Second element is if you have a well ground of fear that the threat will be carried out. And the third element is if there's no reasonable opportunity to escape the threat and harm, then you can make an a duress argument. What's the difference between duress and necessity? Necessity is a choice between two evils that will ultimately achieve a greater good. Remember, necessity is a justification, not an excuse. But duress won't work here because it's not for the benefit of general welfare. And necessity is something that is done for the general welfare. In this case, he had met those elements. There was an immediate threat of danger, or serious bodily injury. And that was, if you, do that, if you don't do this, we'll kill your family. He had a well-grown of fear, 
and that was because they gave him explicit information about his family's dealings, and then he had no reasonable opportunity to escape the threat and harm. What could he have done to escape? Well, he could have run away, he could have fled, or he could have told the police. He said that he didn't tell the police because he thought the police were corrupted, meaning in Colombia, if you told the police, they would probably report you to the drug lord, and instead of getting the help you need, your family might end up dead. He couldn't have fled because that would have involved him leaving his job, taking his family, and leaving the country because of a threat that had occurred. So this is a question that should have gone to the jury. So he could have made the defense. He was entitled to the instruction, and this should have been a jury question. Why do we allow duress as a defense in the first place? Well, let's consider the utilitarian theory as well as the retributive theory. Under the utilitarian theory, he actually can't be charged. Well, you, you don't want to charge him because you can't deter him. Meaning, if you put him in a specific situation where his family's life is at stake, he's not going to be deterred. He's going to do the crime anyways. So utilitarian theory doesn't work. What about retributive theory? Well, you don't want to, you can't punish him because he's actually not morally blameworthy. He's not the one actually committing the crime. Well, technically he is, but ultimately he's not committing the crime for his own purposes. Alrighty, I, I'm sorry about that. I uh, Somebody came in while I, I, I was recording this notes, and so I need to get it a little bit on track. I believe what I was just saying is that he is not, he can't be, he can use the defense because of utilitarian theory and the retributive theory won't find him morally blameworthy. Okay, let's go over how the NPC works as far as the rest goes. Well, there are a couple of differences. First, there's no immediacy requirement like there is in the common law. Second, sorry, excuse me. The threat of harm doesn't need to be death or serious bodily injury in order for you to use the duress defense. And third, homicide charges may actually be all right, meaning you can use it in a homicide charge as an excuse underneath the NPC. And you can't do that, as we'll get into right now, underneath the common law. So, questions that we talked about. In People versus Anderson, what happened here? Person killed somebody camping under duress from the person that he was with and he's saying asking can duress serve as an absolute defense to murder meaning can i be acquitted of murder because i acted in duress and if not well can duress serve as a defense to lower the charge from murder to a lesser crime the first answer to, well, the quest, answer to the first question is no. You can never use duress as an absolute defense to murder. The se answer to the second question is, can duress reduce the charges from murder to a lesser crime? The answer to that is yes, to a certain extent. Ultimately, our biggest takeaways from this case is that, one, duress will never negate a murder charge in its entirety. Two, duress will never be a take a crime from a murder to a manslaughter. And third is that duress could, depending on the circumstances, take it from a first degree murder to a second degree murder. Note, this is all the common law approach. So you may have duress that takes it from a first degree murder to a second degree murder, and that's going to be the extent that duress is going to help you out. And that's all going to depend on the common law definitions of murder and what the jury can actually find. In this case, the jury found that it was premeditated and deliberate. And so duress is not going to serve as an excuse from first degree to second degree murder. So he was charged with first degree murder. He couldn't use the excuse. And so he was convicted of first degree murder.
That's the rest. Let's talk about intoxication. We have one case here. We have United States versus Veatch, and what happened here is that the person was drunk. He caused a car accident, uh, and, and the park rangers came, uh, noticed that he was drunk, confirmed that he was intoxicated, and arrested him. And during the arrest, he resisted, uh, caused an injury to one of the officers, and then on the way back to the detention center, he threatened the life of both officers that ended up showing up and in numerous violent ways, to say the least. He was denied voluntary intoxication as a defense, and he was convicted of two crimes. He was convicted of resistance, and he was convicted of threat the officer. The court looks at this, and they say, you got it right on one of these crimes. You missed it on the second. The reason for that is because we have some rules for voluntary intoxication. When a person is voluntarily intoxicated, they can have that as a defense to specific intent crimes, and only specific intent crimes, and note that's for voluntary intoxication. So let's go over once again what a specific intent crime is. A specific t intent crime is when we have the required mens rea, and you can see it in the statute oftentimes as well a mens rea. In this case, it was the intent to commit dot to dot crime. So one of the crimes was a general intent crime and the other was a specific intent crime. The general intent crime was missing the mens rea. The specific intent crime had the mens rea and so he could use it for the specific intent crime. This is different from involuntary intoxication where you have a defense to both general intent and specific intent crimes. Well, what is involuntary intoxication? There are four types of involuntary intoxication. The first is coerced intoxication. And an example of that is if somebody drove you out to the middle of the desert, said, if you don't drink this beer, then you're going to stay here and die. And so you drink the beer to stay alive. That's coerced intoxication. Then you could have an innocent mistake, meaning you think you're possibly drinking or taking something else, and you're not. It's actually something that's going to impair your body. Third, you have unexpected intoxication. What could happen here is that if you're taking a prescription and you're not aware of the effects that it may have, an instance of this is uh, people who are diabetic, or at least some, uh, will take insulin, and if you take it on an empty stomach, it can actually have some adverse effects on your body that gives the impression as if you are intoxicated. You act the same way, your mind becomes muddled. It, you, you won't have any alcohol in your breath, you're, but you will be acting impaired. And the fourth is a pathological intoxication, and this is when a person takes a normal amount of uh, a substance, believing it to impair them to a normal amount, and instead it impairs them to a much more substantial amount. The reason why you can't, well, the reason why you can use involuntary intoxication as an excuse to both general intent and specific intent crimes is because you won't be able to convict them underneath the utilitarian approach, meaning you can't deter something that is involuntary. They didn't know it happened, so you can't deter it. And second, y you can't punish somebody for someone who didn't do anything morally wrong. Well, there's no moral blameworthy in something that is involuntary. And so as a result, you can use involuntary intoxication to both general and specific intent crimes. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. 
Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited. The only ones that aren't are pre-law materials. And the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice. And with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.